So I'm making this video as, uh, as, a, as a learning tool for you to learn a new, maybe add a new tool into your tool set, into your toolkit when you're working with media. Um, but it's also a PSA on the importance of deinterlacing. And I, it's something that we as an industry don't talk about anymore because we don't really deal with it. And now it's this sort of like remnant, this legacy technology that we only ever have to deal with when we're working with archival media now. And that is that interlacing has been kind of automated and it's been put under the hood in our nonlinear editors like Premiere Pro and Avid and DaVinci Resolve, all of this software tools just sort of kind of just do it automatically. And we don't think about it. You know, we don't set any settings anywhere. We don't really, it's just sort of happens. And I think we take it for granted, but the problem is that this has really destroyed a lot of archival over the last, I've noticed over the last 10 years and that Deinterlacing is sort of at the root of one of the major problems that has been plaguing the quality of archival media since I've been in this business. And so I just, this video is, is a way for me to make you aware of that, but also to show you that it doesn't always have to be that way. And also I want to show you the difference that it makes when you properly consider deinterlacing using a, pro a professional, very sophisticated deinterlacing method, you're going to see the quality difference between what you've been using automatically and taking for granted versus this new method it makes a hell of a difference to your archival media. And it's also just an argument to say that, that deinterlacing is really at the root of most of our problems when it comes to archival. And here's why. Okay, so you have an archival documentary and there's a couple clips on the timeline that you want to reconnect to the original source media and then maybe do some restoration magic on it, a little bit of processing to make it look better and then bring it back into your timeline, whether that's DaVinci Resolve or Premiere Pro. Um, I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm going to show you my process. I'm using DaVinci Resolve because I'm a colorist and restoration artist. So I typically like to work in Resolve. That's like my main home base. And then I have other little satellite forward operating bases that I use for other uh, things like processing, upscaling, deinterlacing. But I always tend to come back to Resolve because that's where we all meet up and have a party and do the color grade and then export for our deliverables. So that's what I'm going to show you. Um, Okay, so here's our timeline. And right here you can see this clip above is the uh is the is the let me turn that track off. So on video track one, there is an AVI file. I'm gonna remove that distracting piece. Um on video track one, this is an AVI. So this is so when you capture archival from a mini DV tape from a tape deck onto a PC. It captures in Premiere Pro as a .avi file, okay? And that's just a Windows way of wrapping um, a, a mini DV or a digital video f file format that has interlacing. If you're on a Mac and you're capturing from a tape deck, it'll capture as a .dv. Um, so a little bit different, but same same file format. There's maybe some compatibility issues between the systems. I'm not sure if uh, all Mac software recognizes a .avi file. Um, but I'm on a Windows system and I'm kind of more prof I'm um, format agnostic at this point. So uh, not really my problem. But if you're on a Mac, if, this may be slightly different uh, nomenclature, but all the same, all the same. OK, so my dot ABI captured raw. Uh, technically, that's not the right term, but my original source capture format is on video track one video track three. Um, and I could make that video track two, just for simple, just to keep things simple. This is my uh, enhanced version of the clip below. And the reason I've done that is because I wanted to deinterlace this .avi file myself using my own deinterlacing algorithm that I feel does a better job than my nonlinear editor. It does a better job than Premiere Pro or DaVinci Resolve. So underneath the hood of some of these nonlinear editors like Premiere Pro, they automatically deinterlace the file for you and you don't really have to think about it. And 
that's a huge convenience because if you're working on an archival documentary that has like a hundred different file formats and clips from different sources, the last thing you want to think about is having to go through and like change the way that the file is interpreted and then interpolated and then deinterlaced and you kind of just want it to work. And I, that's what 95% of us out there do when we're working on an archival project is we just drop things into the timeline and cut it and resize it, use our transform tool to blow it up or move it around or reframe it or crop out some ugly stuff that we don't want to see. And then we hit export and that's it. Um, but for those of us who work in restoration and color grading, we want to get back as high quality format as possible. So sometimes we want a little bit more granular control over our settings and our, on our clip settings. And so that's what this video is about. And so I am going to get in the weeds. We are going to be really annoying and technical, and we're going to have a specific timeline or excuse me, a workflow that may not necessarily jive with how you work normally, but that's okay because I'm making this video about how I work. Um, and if you wanted to get into the weeds too and repair a clip and then bring, do a round trip where you bring it back into resolve and replace that asset with a better, more enhanced upscaled version, this is the video for you. So, I, I have these two different file formats here. Uh, one on video track two, let's label this as restored so that we do not get um, confused and we'll call this source. Sometimes people call it OCF, original camera footage. Sometimes people call it raw. I'm going to call it source because that's as close to the source upstream as I can get. And that is I went back to the tape, recaptured the tape, in a specific format. I did not deinterlace it. It is raw, as raw as raw can get. Okay. Right. So where do we go from here? What's next? Well, I'm going to show you my little map that I've made for you. This is a little bit of my secret sauce. It's not really secret sauce. Everybody knows this. I just put it down in a diagram to make it easier for me to see. I'm a visual person. I'm a visual learner. I have to have things visualized in order to stay organized. Um, I don't know. Maybe something's wrong with my brain, but that's just how I work. This is a workflow, like a pipeline map that I've made, like a roadmap, best practices that I've made for a lot of clients who come to me with an archival documentary and they're like, I don't know what to do. That's all over the place. It's a ton of material. It's on, you know, this one Premiere Pro project and it's a huge mess and now I want to go to color and I want to upscale some shots, but it's just like so overwhelming for me. Stop, take a deep breath and write things down. And it helps you kind of take into, uh, uh, it helps your brain process a very large and overwhelming project with a lot of moving parts. And, uh, this is the map that I've helped keep my brain organized. Uh, I hope it helps you. You may have your own versions. But uh, we, we move from left to right here on this map. And on the left, this is, okay, I received the temporary mix, the temporary titles, and the temporary graphics in a Premiere Pro project. This is the locked edit. Okay, you can spend some time reading, looking at this map by pressing pause on this video and, and reading it yourself. It's not rocket science. We're just basically coming out of Divin out of Premiere Pro or whatever nonlinear editor you're working in, and we're sending these assets to resolve. So this is a this is a round tripping sort of roadmap, as it were. But one step that you may not be familiar with is this VaporSynth step right here. And this is how I work. I work in a tool called VaporSynth that's a frame server. It's a, it's a Python-based video and image processing framework that essentially uh, uses a bunch of different open source plugins and algorithms to do certain things with the video. And then it serves those enhanced frames into a, into a encoder like FFmpeg and then encodes the video out to ProRes after I'm done finishing all my mojo, all my magic, um, my secret sauce. Okay. And then once we're done with that clip, we then encode it to ProRes, but now it has a new name. You can keep the name the same, but just organize it into a different folder called enhanced or um, restored or whatever you want to call it. Just as long as it's documented and you know where it's at and your team knows where it's at. 
and so you can keep the name, the file naming the same uh, so that there's no confusion, but just make sure that it is in a different location and that that location is labeled and then that is documented for your team to recognize in the future. Okay, so keeping the name the same is helpful because then it's very easy for you to just relink that media, uh, reconnect it on the timeline later. But you can also force the conform later if you want. Right here in the conform, we have a nice, clean, conform DaVinci Resolve project of our documentary. It's been synced to our reference movie so that we know that what we have in a DaVinci Resolve timeline is one to one. It's the same as our as our documentary, as our editor gave us, and it's synced up to the reference down to frame accuracy. Now, remember that with uh, when you're working with archival, if you start reconnecting to the original media versus a transcoded media or proxies. Um, there may be a single or two frame discrepancy between the reference movie and what you have on your timeline. And that's okay because the algorithm that was used to deinterlace underneath the hood in Premiere Pro has essentially combined the field lines into a new progressive image. And so when you reconnect to the original interlaced file, the raw capture, it may be off a frame or two frames. And we call that slippage. And that's something I've, I've outlined just here. And there's a slippage tool that you can use in Resolve, um, which I'll show you, that you can use to just adjust that slippage and, and realign your clip to the source. But it's never really going to be frame perfect because it is interlaced and you're using a different algorithm in DaVinci Resolve to interpolate those fields and make the progressive frame versus the what Premiere Pro was using. They're not the exact same. So there, there will always be a little bit of a discrepancy. So you should know that. So if you're trying to like match up and make frame accurate an entire clip that goes on for a couple seconds, it may not necessarily be synced up end to end on every frame. But suffice to say that it is synced up that will match the sound but on some frames it might be slightly off. This is one of the things about working with archival. You're working with different time bases, different uh, frames per second. So your temporal experience on each of those clips is gonna be slightly different. But if, as you conform, that's one of the things that you have to become aware of. That's what a lot of assistant editors are aware of when they're working with archival media is that the sync is never gonna be perfect and that's okay. We need to recognize that and move on. The, the most important thing is that sync over time if there starts to be a drift, that's a problem. But from intermittent frame being off by just a frame intermittently as you, as you play the clip, that's to be expected. And that's what happens when you interpolate time based differently using different algorithms. So, all right, so here we go. We've got a clean project uh, that's been conformed. All right, um, but this step, we wanna pull, we wanna isolate a single clip on our resolve timeline right? We want to isolate, say, this AVI file right here, this green one. We want to take that, work on it separately in a separate piece of software. In this case, I'm going to use VaporSense in hybrid. And then we want to take that raw Calibia, uh, media and bring that into whatever tool we're using to then do the video processing and restoration. You could be using anything from After Effects to MTI, Phoenix, or something open source like I'm going to use. We're going to process that clip by applying all of our filters and changes and deinterlacing, whatever we need to do in VaporSend. And then we're going to take that output. We're going to encode an output. In, the, in our case, I'm going to encode ProRes. Even though I'm on a Windows machine, I can still encode to ProRes. And then we're going to reconform that clip back into our DaVinci Resolve timeline and move on to the next one. And if that's the only clip you have to change and it happens to be on the timeline multiple times, when you relink that media to the new enhanced clip, you need to go through on the rest of the timeline and make sure that everywhere else that that clip pops up, that's been relinked, that there hasn't been a, too much slippage on that clip. And so that's why I typically I'll go through and I'll reconnect and enhance as I go. And then I'll go through and I'll do another time-based pass and I'll make sure that the slippage adjustments are, you know, are made. But uh, here's the truth. There's no fast way around this. This is restoration. It's clip by clip. And if you're dealing with an archival clip on a timeline, especially a feature, well, I mean, it goes for any format, but a feature becomes more important because that clip may pop up multiple times on the timeline. So your attention to detail has to be, you gotta be on it. 
And so there's no quick way to automate this. There is no automation of restoration. Not yet, anyway. I mean, we may get there someday, but th we're not there yet. It's still, with restoration, everything is done by hand. And you have to do it that way because if you just try and automate it and you don't look and make sure, you're definitely going to be out of sync. The clip's going to be wrong. It's going to, you have to do it one by one. It's an attention to detail job. And that's why we get paid. Yeah, that's why re restoring media is so expensive because it's still a human by hand job. And it, it, attention to detail and quality control is um, of utmost importance. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to output the clip, put it into VaporSense, restore it, and then bring it back into Resolve and reconnect it. So I'm going to go ahead and save my project, and I'm going to quit because our uh, tool is using quite a bit of, uh, re of um, it's very resource intensive as we start encoding with hybrid. I'm going to go ahead and launch hybrid right now, and here it is. It's a very simple tool. It kind of looks old school, like from the 90s. <laughs> which I like, uh, but don't let the don't let the aesthetics of the user interface fool you. This is a very powerful and up to date image processing video processing software. Um, all right, so here we go. This is the base page of Hybrid. You can download Hybrid, by the way, for Windows, Mac, or Linux. It's OS agnostic. It's very small, very lightweight, and totally free. It's a single installer. So it's very simple to install. You don't have to do dependencies or libraries or use the command line or anything like that. Uh, you can run DaVinci, excuse me, you can run VaporSynth in command line just as you can use with FFmpeg. So you can do batch clip. You can process a whole batch of, of like a whole folder full of clips, hundreds of clips, thousands of clips. You can uh, run custom scripting. You could do everything through command line, but since this is a user-friendly, um, um, you know, post-production facing uh, vid uh, instructional video, I'm just going to use the GUI for now. Maybe I'll do another video if people want on the scripting side, the command line, which is a lot of fun. Um, you've, you know, but maybe not for this video. So taking the hybrid software, we're going to select ProRes as our output. And we're going to select MOV as our container. You got to do that. You can use MKV, you can use M MPEG4 for other codecs, but for now, we're, we're going to stick with ProRes because that's what most of us in post production use for documentary pipelines because everybody's on a Mac, which there's only a few of us geeks still on Windows and Linux. But I use both and inter interchangeably so because I work with ProRes. So who cares? Like, I'm ambidextrous. Okay. Well, we also need to change our input. So let's open up our input here. Uh, where do we want to get our input? Okay, let's go here, Magic Lantern, Archival. We're going to select our input movie, OFC T001 C001. That's going to be our, our input because that's the clip that's on the timeline that we talked about. I'm going to drag this over into my input folder uh, little, little spot here. You can also browse for it using the browse icon. And I'm also, while I'm here on this page, I'm going to go ahead and set my output folder as well. So go to 01 magic lantern archival, um, DV, we're going to go enhanced. And then I've already made the output because I, I didn't want to wait, make you guys wait for the encode. But uh, that's where you would do it right there. I'm going to go ahead and cancel this, but you would set the name, put your file name, output name here. I basically used the file name, but I changed that to output and then the time and date at which I made the output. But you can, whatever nomenclature you use for your business is fine. Okay, the next step, we're going to go to ProRes and change the profile to 422. I don't use 422HQ for archival because it's overkill. That's, we don't need that much data on our hard drive. And when you're working with archival media, sometimes you're doing whole tape captures. They're 40 minutes long or 50 minutes long. And that's a lot of ProRes 422HQ, especially if you're going to do an upscale, which we're going to do. Um, it's a lot of media. And if you're working with hundreds of clips, that's not, let's not do that. Um, you're just wasting hard drive space. 
Don't worry about the encoder. There's different types of encoders, but Costia, you want to stick with Costia because that's what's compatible with most of our systems. Now on this clip, I am going to do an upscale and I'll show you why I'm going to do an upscale in just a moment. In fact, let's do that right now. I'm going to turn off our deinterlacing and uh, let's see, do I do any sort of other... I don't think I did any other settings here. Okay, good. All right. We're going to hit the play button. Now, this button right here allows you to preview your clip in uh, hybrid. And so it's going to take a second. The first time always takes a little bit longer than, the, than the, if you click on that button in the future. But the first time it takes a minute to load the clip and then do, uh, do an analysis real quick. What I've done is on the image on the left has not been upscaled yet. And I'm not talking about an AI upscale so much as I am talking about using a sophisticated method of interpolating pixels as you increase the resolution by a factor of two. And what, what, what we're essentially doing is we're telling the computer we want to use a very certain type of math in order to um, increase the pixel resolution of details in the image. Now that sounds a little technical, but as you can see here, look at the size of the pixels and how blocky they are compared to the image on the right. Which, by the way, I don't know if you can see this in the encoded version on YouTube. But you can see little tiny squares, little blocks and pixels on the image on the right as well. Okay. But they're, sm they're so much smaller that the level of detail that it yields on the edges and certain details, it looks so much better, so much more clear. And there's more uh, granularity. There's more smoothness. It's an increase in the apparent, re apparent resolution. <clears throat> and the algorithm that I'm using for that in VaporSynth is something called NNEDI3. And I won't go into details on what, what that is, but it suffice to say that it's a very powerful tool to interpolate pixels whenever you're increasing your resolution by a factor of two. So I could go a factor of four as well and get slightly more detail out of this, but then I'm up in the 4K realm for, for, from, a, of a, from an SD file coming from a mini DV image, and I think that's overkill. You start to get diminishing returns, but simply doing a single upscale by a factor of two makes a huge difference. And that's why I do this in, uh, in VaporSynth. <clears throat> In fact, I'm going to zoom out real quick for now and then bring our tool back to the foreground. So in order to do this, you need to resize your image, take, turn off the auto adjust. We're going to go from 720 to 1440 because we are doing a 2x upscale by 960. And I use bicubic spline because it's a little smoother. There are certain uh, algorithms like uh, Lanzos, for example, that's a little sharper. But I don't like my upscales to be super sharp. I just want the apparent resolution to increase. And I like to keep the details a little on the smoother side, a little more on the filmic side, if you know what I'm saying, a little more, a little more um, organic. So that's our resize. We do that first before we move on to filtering. And when we get to filtering, the other thing that we need to do is we need to deinterlace the image. And this is something that's really important when you're working with archival media that was tape based. All tape based media, mini DV, high eight, pneumatic, beta cam, VHS, reel to reel, all of these tape based um, video formats were interlaced. In fact, uh, almost all of it. Um, so if you get original tape captures back from the lab, you most certainly should have interlaced. Any lab that deinterlaces the file before giving it to you on a hard drive is suspect to me because that's not really the real, that's not the right way to give someone raw media, source media. And the reason is, is because if anytime you deinterlace a file, 
you are creating what's called a destructive process. You're destruct, you're destroying the original integrity of the source media. And the reason that's important is because as we've gone, uh, over the last 20 years, there have been some more sophisticated algorithms that have been developed for deinterlacing. So <clears throat> if you captured a tape back in 1999 or in 2002, and you have the original AVI file that has the interlace, the separate interleaved fields in the file. In other words, it's still interlaced. That's great. Because now you can use the latest tools to then reconstruct a progressive image out of those two separate field lines and create a much more superior image with more fidelity. And so I, I, I don't think that people really understand just how important de -inter the deinterlacing process is to reconstructing high quality archival. It has a huge impact on the quality, on the apparent sharpness, on the color information, on the color encoding and the compression, it has a huge effect on all of it because the way that you encode and compress a progressive image is, is different from the way that you encode and compress an interlaced image. And the image fidelity is so much better. And that's why um, we, we should talk about QTGMC real quick. So not all deinterlacing is created equal. There are different types of algorithms and tools that have been developed to merge two interleaved interlacing field lines into a progressive image. And the reason why it's a little tough and not everybody has been able to do it well is because there's both, both a spatial element and a temporal element to interlacing. So as a, a, uh, an interlaced camera is recording an image, let's say a soccer game, those individual field lines, they're separated into two different categories, upper field and lower field. And typically when a camera records an interlaced image onto tape, the tape head is spinning and it's recording as it's spinning. And so as the soccer ball, say, flies through the frame of the shot, the upper field is capturing at a different frequency from the lower field. And each one of those field lines are being scanned across the tape as it's being recorded. So you have a little bit of a temporal skew introduced into the recording of the file, meaning that when the soccer ball is in the upper part of the, the left-hand side of the frame and it's flying from left to right, by the time it gets to the right-hand side of the frame, a different portion of the image is being recorded. And so... <clears throat> What deinterlacing algorithms do is they take that time discrepancy into account and rebuild the image, but by reintroducing a little bit of a temporal deskew. And so you're having to reconstruct a spatial image pixel by pixel, but you're also having to reconstruct time. And that's really tricky. And um, some algorithms are more sophisticated and some are less sophisticated. And the reasoning is computational requirements. So this tool right here called QTGMC, it's one of the world's most powerful deinterlacing algorithms. And the reasoning is, is because it takes a lot of computational resources. We're gonna set our algorithm here under filtering and go to deinterlace telecine. And then we'll go over here to the right, select QTGMC, make sure the vapor synth is selected. Oh, that, I think that's by default. Don't worry about overwriting the input scan or forcing the top field first or whatever. We'll see that in a moment. We're going to set this to uh, our preset. We're, I'm going to set it to slower because I found that setting it to very slow and placebo tend to be a little overkill. And I don't quite recognize the difference unless there's a lot of motion. And usually the computational requirements are such that I don't... I don't want to sit around and wait for the file, especially if we're doing batches, if I'm working with like say 50 or 60 clips that need to be worked and transcoded, that's a significant amount of transcoding time, computational time. So I'm going to set this to slower, although I have set it to slow and medium in the past and they were just fine. So it's up to you. I would do some tests for yourself, but typically slower does a great job. Um, it, 
even fast, I have to say, even fast has yielded pretty good results. So I would say fast, medium, and slow are your are your choices. If you have a little bit of time, slow is definitely worth it. So I'm just going to set it to slow for now. Leave this to even. We're not going to bob. That's cutting the frame rate in half. But the most important thing you need to know is which field order uh, your source video is in. Typically, standard definition mini DV captured on a prosumer camera is um, captured at bottom field first, but let's go check our media out just to be sure. Set this to extra. Okay, this is our source. So I'm gonna, I've installed a free program called Media Info. It's open source. It adds itself to your, your right click menu, pull down menu. So you can click on a clip and you can find out information about the metadata. So I see here 720 by 480, 4 by 3, 2997, interlaced, bottom field first. So if I hover my mouse over this, uh, over hybrid, over the tools, it tells me here that bottom field first is set to a parameter of zero, an integer indicator there or selector there. We want to set that to zero and i also use neo but you don't have to you can read a little bit more about this just use my settings for now you can use your large language model like chat gpt or gemini or claude to tell you a little bit more about each one of these settings because it's pretty well versed in this tool okay so we've set our deinterlacing. that's fine i'm happy with that Another couple things that I want to do is I do want to convert my color matrix from Rec 601 to Rec 709. And I'm going to do that with this tool. I could do that in Resolve as well, but uh, for those of you who don't have the color management or color space transform tools in your, in say, Premiere Pro, you can uh, you can use lots to do tr color transforms or but I, I like the way that this handles the color um, matrix conversion so I use it so typically Rec 601 was a standard definition color space before we moved on to high definition in the early aughts and then a new standard Rec 709 was in, was uh, adopted to to be the color space for HD but legacy color spaces you need to be aware of those as well. And media info will not reliably tell you whether or not something is 601 unless it was manually tagged at the time. And some archival is, depending on the post house that uh, captured that uh, initial media and the method they used. But I'm going to do my color space conversion here. Um, there's also, you can deblock if you've got a really heavily blocked, uh, heavily compressed MPEG 4 file from the internet. You can deblock using different methods and fine tune your deblocking here. If you're, if you've got some old film that has uh, grain on it, but that's been compressed into oblivion, you can degrain and then add your own grain later. Some really sophisticated tools here. You see how deep this software is. And this is why I love using it because I can, there are so many novel problems with archival video that come up in my day-to-day -day job. But sometimes I need a very specific plugin to fix it. And guess what? Plugins for Resolve are few and far between. There's not a very rich development ecosystem for open effects for DaVinci Resolve for whatever reason. It's just not that many of us out there. But for video processing in general, that community is huge because you've got a lot of people who are restoring anime and Star Trek and Star Wars DVDs and laser discs and it's this whole community of nerds out there that have spent a lot of their time developing sophisticated tools to overcome novel problems and all of those sophisticated tools have been combined into a single tool called VaporSynth, uh, excuse me, Hybrid that's been Silur, the developer for Hybrid, thank God, spent all of this time putting this compiling these tools into one user interface and it's all free and open source. I mean, how amazing is that? There's another program called Stacks Rip, S-T-A-X Rip, uh, that I've used and it's just like hybrid. It's a little more, um, it's kind of a cooler interface, but a little bit different. 
You can do scripting in that tool as well. I just have been using hybrid for a long time and I find it to be easy to install and use for most people. So that's what I'm showing you today. The other thing that I love doing with, uh, with mini DV footage is I like to dehalo. And in fact, let's go, let's go ahead and, and, uh, resize. I'm going to use synth auto refresh just so that it refreshes our viewer so that we can see what I'm doing with the file. In fact, let's keep it to this magnification. Okay. Look here along the sleeve, the shoulder of this soldier. This is what I'm talking about when I use D halo. In fact, let's increase our neurons to 256. Let's increase our block size to 30 to 32 by six. The larger the block, the neighborhood, the more accurate the uh, process is. I'm also going to turn on GPU so that it uses my GPU to render versus the CPU. There we go. It's a little bit more snappy response now. Okay. So you see how the resizer is now reading my, my output resized value that we set to 1440 by 960. That's what it's going to use to inform itself. Now I could go, I could quadruple the size and it would use that as well. And we may see a marginal improvement. Um, but I'm going to leave it to 1440 by 960 because as I had said earlier, the diminishing returns and all that plus file size. These are issues you have to take into account when you're using, um, you're working with archival is this stuff scales rapidly and it becomes a problem, but let's go back to the halo. I use find the halo because I found that has the best results for do, removing something that is inherent in mini DV and a lot of VHS and a lot of these, um, analog or even digital, uh, standard definition video formats is they tend to in their image processing set, um, image processor chips that are inside the camera by default, they sharpen the footage. This is what they used to do back in the day because they came from film and then they went to tape and they realized, Oh, this tape thing, standard definition, this is nowhere near the same resolution as film. We're kind of downgrading. And so for like a period of 50 years after moving from, film to tell, you know, from cinema to the theater and excuse me, from cinema to television, and then from film to archival, excuse me, to tape based standard definition recording formats, we sacrificed resolution. And that's why it's amazing when you see mini DV footage from the nineties, you know, compared to archival film footage captured on 16 and 35 millimeter back in the 1950s, they don't compare. The film is so much higher resolution, so much better quality, more image fidelity, better colors. It's more, just more resolution. There's more information there. So in order to compensate for that loss, they over sharpened the hell out of everything. And that was kind of built into the camera. This was back in the day when you couldn't go deep into the camera menus and change all of the, all of the input values. And we weren't recording to log at the time you kind of got what you got. And there were a few little settings that we used to nerd out about on these cameras. You would always reduce sharpening. That was like the first thing you did. Turn down the sharpening, the over the coring, and uh, just let the image record itself without any enhancements or image processing done in camera. And then you could do everything else later in post. Well, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm combating now. I'm combating this process and I'm going to turn off find the halo and you're going to see this black line appear when it resyncs. There's a little bit of a black line that appears around all of the high contrast edges. So for example, his hat, his bright hat against a black background, this woman's black trousers, that bugs me. And when it's Image wide, if I were to zoom out on a wide image, you would see that even more. So what Find the Halo does is it lifts the black level of that edge. And it does that on all the high contrast ed edges across the image. Um, you can see it all the way down, running down the sleeve here. Let's see, I'm going to turn that back off so you can see. Let it refresh. And that black line is back. 
You see that? That black line right there. That is over sharpening. I'm going to, I'm going to remove it right now. Watch. Gone. Well, it's less. Anyway, I can turn up the sharpness. In fact, I think I've, I've been using 1.5 strength. So let's hit enter and let that do its thing again. Now, the higher you lift this, I found that anything over two, it starts to become gray. And so it's, it calls attention to itself again. But this time, instead of it being a black line, it's a white or gray line. So 1.5, I found to be the better. So let's turn that off and we'll zoom in. There's that black line again. And I know it sounds like I'm obsessing over something really stupid and and like super nerdy in the weeds here, but I can tell, I can see the image. Let's try it. Let's turn on Findy Halo and let's watch that line disappear. Watch this. Gone. Okay, now you apply that to the entire image and what you get is a much more soft, less over sharpened video look. And it's just that I'm telling you, man, it's like a huge difference. Now, what that does is it does impart a slight soft, um, almost like a one eighth pro mist kind of vibe on the image. It's a little bit more of a glowy cause it, 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 it applies to even edges like this on top of material, not just high contrast edges at the edge of material or on the outline of someone's body, but it applies to all sorts of details and uh, let's see, can we show the mask? Outside mask, here we go. So this is basically everywhere in the image that this filter has been applied. So it's quite a lot. But this is also showing you how much of the image has been affected by the filter and taken as a whole, it does have an, it has a qualitative effect both quantitative, but also mainly qualitative effect to the image. I'm going to turn it on and off while we're zoomed out here. Well, I'm still at a three by magnification, but I'm going to turn it off and you can kind of tell there's this sort of softness that's applied to the image. And I like that. I like that because it takes the edge off. It's not over sharpened. It has a little bit more of a glowy, soft feel filmic vibe to it and so i personally like it now the other thing that you should be aware of is that qtgmc when it deinterlaces a clip it also part of its package is it has a denoiser has a both a spatial and a temporal denoiser now it's set to uh on a little bit more on the minimum deep by default so it's not overly aggressive so i'm fine with it right here but as a restoration artist, something I need to be aware of is to always not be overly destructive to the image. Any, anytime you restore it, something, you're not preserving it so much as in the, how like the technical standards organizations would see as preservation. But what you are doing is you're uh, trying to remove a lot of the uh, novel artifacting that occurs in these video formats in order to enhance what image is underneath that. And so one of those, um, one of the issues that I find uh, problematic in the restoration space, and I saw this, I'm sure you did as well, for a show like Get Back for Disney, the series, was they were really aggressive with the noise reduction. And I really don't like that, but that's a personal thing. That's, that's just me. I don't want to speak for everybody else. But I kind of like some of the analog noise that's, uh, uh, well, digital in this case, because it's mini DV, but some of this noise that I see here, I'm going to play it right now so you can see. When you start to pull that out, when you start to remove it, the image starts to quickly become artificial and you lose some of the original character of the footage. And I don't like that. I find that the restoration at that point begins to call attention to itself. And, uh, and so I tend to back off at that point, but I'm okay with this level of noise reduction because it's not heavy handed at all. I don't find that it's stripped out any of the, uh, the noise that is, that is not expected. 
Okay, there's still a lot of noise here, and it's both uh, both luminance and chrominance noise, and I kind of want to hold on to that. Plus, uh, my denoiser that I use is called Neat Video. It's the best in the world, and I use that built into DaVinci Resolve, and I prefer to use DaVinci Resolve for my noise reduction for that reason. There's a There are a ton of denoisers in the hybrid, as I showed you earlier. Um, right here you have the option to degrain and denoise and you can set a million parameters for these and tweak and get it down to exactly how you like it if you just want to do everything in batch right you can do that a good reason to do that might be a ton of high eight material high eight typically tends to be really noise heavy and i find that high eight benefits very well from a noise reduction you can really uh take the noise out that temporal aspect of the image out and it reveals a ton of information below so if you're if you have high eight footage of like say a nightclub or someone at a restaurant or someone at a birthday party and then it's dim and it's dark there's just not a lot of information there and the noise you know what i'm talking about if you if you have high eight footage you know what i'm talking about if you're ever inside or if it's night you are screwed because there's no information there and so removing the noise on the temporal noise on something like hey high eight makes a huge difference and i think it's worth the time for mini dv especially out outdoor stuff um but in general mini dv is not super noisy but um if you are going to do it i would say i would highly recommend neat video and do it within your nle and i think the processing will move a little bit faster as well the computational power of your nle using the neat video it's been optimized for your gpu and, and your nle you're going to get superior results both from a noise reduction standpoint but also from a computational speed standpoint so less render time more beer time Okay, so where we leave off? We left off with uh, me talking about denoising through QTGMC. If you do want to have a little bit more of a of a hands-on with QTGMC and you want to change your noise settings, you go down to custom and then you can set all of that. You can reduce your denoising significantly and uh, get into the weeds there more. Um, and we're not going to do that in this video. But uh, feel free to talk to your GPT um, if you want a little bit more detailed information about that process. Okay, so for the for the resizer, which is essentially the last thing I'm going to do now that we've dehaloed the image, let's make sure our dehalo is there. Yep, and 1.5 strength, that's good. Make sure you go to frame because we're gonna we're gonna have to cash in on our two by upscale here. We need to fit, you know connect the other side of that resize pipe. And the other size is choosing the method at which we want to rescale. And there's a couple of different algorithms. It's quite a few actually options for you to resize. Um, I found that NEDI3 works great for archival media, specifically tape-based archival media. Okay, I haven't tried. Uh, I've tried Waifu on uh, some cartoons. It works really great for two-dimensional cartoons, straight lines, and solid colors. And, things like that. Um, I played with real Coogan a little bit, but some of these other ones, I have never tried them. And um, I'd be curious to know, maybe I'll make another video about that. Um, I would talk to your GPT about getting more granular details on, on the recommendations for settings here, but these are the settings I found work best for me. And I do always choose spline 64 for my downsizer because it's a little more smooth. It's not over sharpened. And for and I do select GPT uh, my GPU because that does speed up my render time significantly. And I and I'm on a Windows system. I'm using uh, an NVIDIA GPU, so I do have those CUDA cores. And uh, and what you'll find when it comes to video processing, in general, is that the video processing community greatly tends to skew towards Windows users, and so they're typically when it comes to video processing tools and really geeky tools like frame interpolation and and uh, restoration tools and software it's almost always windows okay so whenever you're ready to encode you need to come back to the base page and then save your output file directory directory plus the output file name in this case i'm just gonna i'm not actually gonna create a new file i'm just gonna call this zero 
that's been output with a name and a directory. We hit the plus sign right there, and then that job goes to the job queue. Once you have added that to your job queue, you can press the play button right here, and then it will begin encoding your video and go make a cup of coffee. Okay, so once you're done encoding that file, you may want to bring that in and compare against your original AVI file just to see, well, what is the quality difference? Um, I've queued up uh, the two and I've synced the two on top of each other so we can do a side-by-side -side comparison. And uh, I'm gonna do a side-by-side -side comparison right now. So on this file, you can see, let me in fact make this window a little bit bigger for you. Um, you can see here that uh, we've magnified by uh, quite a bit on the viewer on the right, 210%. I'm going to show you what the original file looks like. This is the original. See all the aliasing? The sort of the stair-stepping? One, two, three, four. All the stair-stepping on these diagonal lines right here. The edge of the hat. Look at this. Look at these lines here. Now I'm going to show you my upscaled version. Look at those perfect clean lines. It's almost like film. It's very organic, very smooth, very consistent. The noise, even the noise pattern is nice and clean. Let me turn that off and go back to the original. All right, we've got a little bit of temporal blurring here because it's it's trying to combine the previous frame and this coming frame. So it's like got a little bit of a, a time blend, a little bit of a, a phase out of phase kind of look to it. This is the upscaled version, nice and clean. It's reconstructing the temporal data uh, from the very beginning. So you're getting a lot better visual integrity and clean lines. Look at this, this is a huge difference. And that looks like a, a cl nice clean image there, right? Now imagine what that's what this is doing to your noise if you're not reconstructing your image properly, how the noise profile starts to change. It starts to become a little more clunky, a little larger, a little more unpredictable. I, I find this to be a really powerful workaround, especially for mini DV footage. This reconstructing through a deinterlacing first approach is definitely the way to go. This is how you this is how you get stellar looking archival mini dv footage just reconstruct it using proper time look at this i mean this may be a frame off here like i was saying earlier sometimes you get out of sync there we go Look at the information around this guy's shoulders. This is just, he's like stepping. There we go. That's a little bit better of a better side-by-side -side comparison. There's really no comparison now, you know? Like what even is this object right here? You can't even tell what this object is in the original. But with uh, the upscale and the re de interlacing, um, I can tell it's a, go a golf cart. It's hard to miss a hot dog cart in New York City. This is before and this is after. That is a massive difference. Before and after. Look at the color information. Remember I was talking earlier about how the color information is not encoding properly. Half of, uh, at least a third of his ear is the wrong color doesn't even have skin tone on it. And when you get into the color grade, that's going to be a problem. Let me look at the side. Yeah, look at the side of his face. Sort of the color bleed, right? This is the original. You're getting these echoes, the color bleeding echoes, and it's not being, those color channels are not being interpolated properly. So you get these huge vertical color blocks. That is unacceptable. And if you, th it, it, the, the color bleeding and the blocking and the interpolation issue is not only to the right side of his face, but it's actually on top of his face. And that's what's obscuring some of the view of his mouth and his nose. You can't even see his eye properly in the original. Look at this. Where is he looking? 
Now you can actually see the white of his eye. I mean, this is information that is lost in the original improper encode. That is not acceptable. So this is, I just wanted to show you this as another example and just the quality, his name tag, his uniform, it just kind of falls apart. But by reconstructing it properly, you get these beautiful edges, beautiful detail. It looks like film. If you needed more proof uh, regarding uh, horizontal or diagonal lines, um, that's, that tends to plague us the most. And this is whenever I'm watching archival in a documentary, if I'm at the theater or watching TV, this is something that always catches my eye and I immediately know, and now you're going to know, and I'm going to ruin it for you. It's an immediate tell on whether or not something has been deinterlaced properly. And that is stair stepping, right? Look at this is in the New York City subway. Okay. Look at the lines in the ceiling. These diagonal lines running through the frame. They have these huge stair stepping stair stepping uh artifacts properly deinterlaced. Look at that. No comparison. This is before and this is after. Now tell me which of those is uh, closer to how it was captured on the day. Uh, the other thing that tends to happen is you end up getting these big blocks of color. Look, you can't even make out their faces, actually. You get these big, chunky blocks of color because the color channel was not interpolated properly. And so what ends up happening when you go into the color grade is when you try and color grade a clip, where the color channels have not been interpolated properly in the deinterlace, you have these big chunks. So you, when you change the color, you try and white balance the scene. There are these huge chunks of color that end up shifting hue and they call attention to themselves. Whereas if you want to work with something that's been properly reconstructed, you have a little bit more fidelity in the color channels to then change those colors and to get into the weeds and repair the clip and re white balance and balance the RGB channels. So anyway, that's another reason why deinterlacing is important. It's not just because of the luminance or the spatial, um, uh, reconstruction. It's also has to do with the color channels and how you reconstruct those as well to have more fidelity in the color. I hope this has been a help and I hope that you give hybrid a try. I also hope that uh, the, the concept of going in clip by clip and individually repairing things is not overwhelming and that you see the value in doing it if it means that your archival will be upgraded in, into a more pristine condition and closer to the creative intent of how it was originally captured. So anyway, if you like this video, like and subscribe, please, below. And also let me know in the comments if you want me to make some more about uh, hybrid because it's a powerful, fun tool and it's free. I'll see you in the next one.